first part of this talk is going to concern deep underground military bases and the black budget. Let me first start by emphasizing the black budget. The black budget is a secretive group, basically a secret budget. It garners one quarter of the gross national product, the entire gross national product of these United States. At present, the gross national product is around five trillion dollars. So one quarter of that's about one one and a quarter trillion dollars per year. Uh, at least 1.023 trillion, and I say at least, is used in black budget programs like deep underground military bases. <coughs> Presently. There are 129 deep underground military bases in these United States. Anyway, of these 129 bases, they've been building them day and night unceasingly for since the early 40s. Some of them were built even earlier than that. These bases comprise basically of large cities underground. They're connected by high-speed monorail magneto leviton trains that can go up to Mach 2. The average depth of each base is roughly a mile deep. They are basic whole cities hollowed out underground. They are somewhere between two and two-thirds cubic miles and four, cu four and a quarter cubic miles hollowed out underground. You might ask how this is done. Well, right now they have laser drilling machines that can drill a tunnel seven miles in one day. Obviously, we the public uh, don't have information from them. We're not told about this. So, unfortunately, I don't believe these things. Uh, the black pro projects, as we know them, sidestep Congress, which is illegal. Uh, right now, the New World Order is depending upon these bases. And if I'd known it was the New World Order involved, I wouldn't have had anything to do with them. I would, I would lie to rather extensively. So. Now, basically, they, the technology as we know it for every calendar year that goes by, every 12 month calendar year, the military technology increases about 44 and a half years. This is why it's easy to understand that back in 1943 they were able to create a, through vacuum tube technology, uh, a ship that literally disappeared from one place and reappeared 400 miles later in another place. Uh, my father, Otto Oscar Schneider, there's an interesting story about him. Um, he fought on both sides of the war. He was originally a U-boat captain. He was captured. Came up. He was captured by the French. He was turned over to the United States Army. He was turned over to the United States Navy. He was repatriated here to Cocoa Beach, Florida, and Fort Lauderdale, and uh, taken up to uh, uh, Philadelphia Navy Yard thereafter. And he was a master machinist as well as uh, an Navy doctor. He later became an Navy doctor. He never did anything like that. But basically, he was involved with uh, uh, different kinds of concerns, um, such as uh, A bomb and H bomb and, and uh, Philadelphia experiment uh, and these other kinds of projects. Uh, his groundwork, he, he invented a camera, a high speed camera, that took pictures of the first atomic tests in Bikini Island and uh, 12th of July 1946, to which I have original photographs of, which show unidentified flying objects fleeing the bomb site at a high rate of speed. Bikini Island at the time was infested with little things in, in various depths of, of its waters. The natives always saw them. The natives had problems with their cattle, or basically pigs is what they raised. And other things, although uh, this story has never come out, uh, this is basically what happened. So, uh, at that time, through General MacArthur and others, they felt that, uh, in fact, General MacArthur was coined in saying the term, the very next world war we have will be the war of 
uh, not with uh, people from planet Earth, but from people, uh, from aliens or people from other planets. And uh, this man was, uh, if we hadn't had him during World War II, we wouldn't be here today. Anyway, my father had laid the groundwork with theoreticians about Bill Delphi's experiment and other experiments. What does that have to do with me? Other than the fact of that, uh, all I can say is that uh, if it wasn't for... See, he never told his kids this, and he kind of kept it secret until a couple of weeks before he died. Um, I kind of regretfully say that. Um, I don't agree with what he did on the other side of the pond in Nazi Germany, but I'll tell you one thing. I think he had a lot of guts in coming here and doing what he did. He was hated in his own land. In fact, there was a there was a million dollar in gold reward for anybody who could kill him. Just bring the picture back of the dead, the dead person, and it never happened. Anyway, back to uh, topic number one: is dumb bases or deep underground military bases. We've been basically lied to, folks. Uh, we've been lied to a long time. Number one, the alien question. Uh, nobody really knows the truth. We've been ruined by Madison Avenue. Has painted painted a very unrealistic picture of what's going on with outer space aliens and and, and the insider government, especially at Groom Lake. This particular facility, the hat shows. Uh, this wasn't the original insignia. This is kind of like the a local uh, uh, fish wrapper type insignia. You know, the original insignia had a skunk on it because I was part of the infamous skunk words. So, uh, anyway, this particular base originally is housed up to 117 live alien uh, critters or whatever you want to call them. Um, right now, it's not housing much of anything. Most of the stealth hardware has been has been removed. They moved it over to Kirtland Air Force Base. First of all, I want to tell you about aliens and the alien agenda. Back in 1954, under the Eisenhower administration, the federal government decided to circumvent the Constitution of the United States and form a treaty outside of the borders of the United States, within the borders of the United States, well, basically uh, a treaty from entities outside of the borders of the United States, and it was supposed to be secret. It was called the GREATA 1954 Treaty, GREATA, GREATA, GREATA 1954 Treaty. That basically said that the aliens could take a few cows and, and, and test their, uh, test their uh, uh, implanting techniques on a few human beings, but they had to give detailed lists of the people involved, et cetera, et cetera. Slowly but surely, the outer space aliens slowly uh, altered the bargain until they decided they wouldn't go by it at all. And back in 1979, this was a reality. The firefight occurred kind of by, quite by accident. I was involved in we were building an addition to the deep underground military base at Del State, New Mexico, which, by the way, is a probably the United States deepest base. It goes down seven levels over two and a half miles deep. And, but at that particular time, we had drilled four distinct holes in the desert ground, and we were going to link them together with shape charge explosives. And then we were going to basically blow out large sections at a time. Well, when, uh, when I was a and I, my job at that time was to go down in these holes, gather rock samples, uh, check them for their particularity or particle count, um, give a detailed account of uh, what kind of chemical explosive or plastic explosive to use, and go from there. Um, as I was headed down there, uh, to my total surprise, uh, we found ourselves amidst a, a large cavern uh, that was already uh, full of uh, outer space aliens, otherwise known as large graves. I was petrified, as most people might be. 
Uh, the only thing I could think of doing at the time was shooting at them. I killed two of them, but by the time I could reload uh, and refire at that time, I had a Walter PPK pistol. I was an engineer, so I didn't feel I had to carry a gun underground. And I always carried this particular one. It's nice and small and it's quite effective. But uh, anyway, I emptied and uh, killed a couple of these things. And uh, at that time, there was several other groups of people down there. It's about 30 people total, and 30 uh, to almost 40 or more came down there, and they all got killed. Um, basically, what had occurred was that we surprised a whole inter under under mountain base of existing aliens, and later I was to find out. We are not the highest on the food chain. These aliens have probably been living on our planet for the better, different groups of aliens anyway, the short and the tall grays at least for a million years, living here. And uh, uh, this could explain a lot of the theory behind the ancient theory of uh, ancient astronauts and these other kinds of things like that. It might also explain the bloodthirstiness of different kinds of native populaces like the Aztecs, etc., etc. Old Max and whatnot. Anyway, I got shot basically here, and uh, 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 their kind of weapon wasn't really a gun like thing, it was kind of like a box that they had on their body that they could manipulate. And uh, it burned a hole in me and it split my ribs apart and kind of gory and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, it uh, also gave me a high dose of uh, rather nasty cobalt radiation. And uh, I later I have cancer to this day. It's probably a result of it, although I can't prove that. Okay, the second part of my talk is topic number two. Uh, it includes uh, basically how this all occurred. How could we have possibly gotten involved? Well, we finished when working with, uh, we basically were beaten down by World War II. And uh, I guess uh, uh, we were figured to be rather vulnerable as a populace in the world, which we were at the time. And uh, I'm sure this is probably why we at our weakest point were later found out to, uh, to uh, uh, be vulnerable indeed. And so we were basically attacked. And of course, I think some of us, how many people here are familiar with the crash at Aztec, New Mexico? Raise your hand. In 1947, sometime in July of 1947, there was a large crash of a flying saucer. Uh, I believe it had uh, seven or eight alien uh, critters or whatever you want to call them, aliens in them. One survived, and I believe uh, six or seven were. Uh, I don't know the whole story about the whole thing. And one of the artifacts I have here on the table is uh, when, I was ch when I was a young child, I was uh, about 14 time. Um, I had a friend of my father, was uh, Sir Johnny Rollins. Uh, he, was, uh, he had a British naval intelligence. And uh, he gave me, I asked him if I could have a piece of metal in this crashed disc, and my father protested violently. And I, But anyway, you know, Johnny Rollins said, sure, I can give you a little piece. And, you know, was, uh, gave me a little piece of adamant in my collection ever since. That was kind of like the small start of the collection. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah. UFOs really wasn't my bag until uh, I started work at Area 51, uh, which is in the Nellis Air Force Base uh, north of uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, during in uh, going back in 1979 in a firefight, it took me about two and a half years to recuperate, enough that I could go back to work. But I did. I survived. I went back to work. Through Morrison Knudsen at EGMG and back to all on page and page and other construction outfits at the time. <coughs> anyway, uh, at Area 51, they were testing all kinds of very peculiar spacecraft. I think you're also, how many people here, for instance, are familiar with Bob Lazar's story? Good. That's, that's a good, good group indeed. I, I'd suggest you, more of you uh, 
uh, buy his or obtain his tape or borrow his tape and uh, read some of the publications. He was a physicist who worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, at Area 51 trying to decipher the, what was the propulsion factor of, of basically these alien spacecraft, these disks and other kinds of type of, type of craft. 